The climate is the, the description of the large-scale um, environmental variables. So, for example, it would describe the average temperature, the average wind, the average humidity of an area of the globe. It's different from weather. Uh, the weather is the very uh, immediate effect in a particular area at a particular time. But the climate is the more average expected um, weather or uh, variables that, that describe the environment. So of course this varies hugely uh, across the globe. So we know very well it's warmer in the tropics than it is at high latitudes. Um, we know that it's wetter in the tropics with the big storms. It's drier around the 30 degrees latitude mark um, because it's an um, area where air is descending. We know that we have storm tracks in the middle latitudes uh, which describe the weather there. And then there's other patterns around the globe. So, for example, um, there's the El Nino event, which is um, a sporadic event in the tropical Pacific, where there's um, much changes in the rainfall and uh, changes in the ocean temperatures, um, which happens every two or three years. So people have been interested in the climate forever. Uh, of course, it has an immediate effect on how we carry on our lives. And whether it's going to rain or, or be cold at a particular time of year or in a particular area is very important to the way that the tumour activity um, progresses. So in studying um, climate science, um, it's been uh, well established with measurements of temperature, uh, humidity, wind speed at various stations across the globe. And nowadays, of course, we have um, satellites which are measuring uh, all these variables through the atmosphere on a very, very regular basis, which is providing science with a wonderful database on which to base our understanding. Uh, when we talk about climate, um, we often think about climate change. And what does this mean? It means that um, something is different. So it's, you have an average. But around the average, you also have some variation. So we know, for example, that in the UK, in January, it's colder than in June, but it won't be the same every January. And there's a huge variation from one year to the next. But when we talk about climate change, we're thinking of a very, very slow trend. So over uh, many decades, the uh, temperature in January is changing in a trend, and that's what we would call climate change. It's more complicated because it's not the same at all places on the globe. So some places will be warming more than others in response to climate change. So we know that there's different patterns of climate across the globe and we can understand from the basic physics why they come about. So we know there's more sunshine coming in um, at the equator and that makes the tropics hotter. And that means that heat has to be transferred from the low latitudes to the high latitudes so that the heat is going to be transferred by the atmosphere and by the oceans. And how it is transferred is the actual uh, essence of the climate. Uh, in, in the lower latitudes, it's transferred by overturning circulations, which are known as the Hadley cells. There's ascending air near the equator. The ascending air is associated with rainfall, because as the air ascends, it gets colder and the rain drops out. That air moves towards the poles, and then it sinks um, near about 30 degrees latitude in the north and the south. And those are very dry areas because the air is descending and it's dry. Then in the mid-latitudes we have the storm tracks which are coming across the oceans and they determine the weather and climate of the middle latitudes, so say 40 to 60 degrees north and south. Uh, we also have the, the, the trade winds, so they're winds that are going from the, uh, in the northern hemisphere from the northeast towards the equator and from the southeast, from south of the equator, and they meet at the, at the equator in what the uh, old seamen used to call the doldrums, where the, where the air is meeting and there's no wind. The doldrums, so they don't have any wind for their sailing ships. Then in mid-latitudes we have the westerlies associated with the storm tracks, driving the weather patterns around the globe. In very high latitudes, again, we have a different uh, circulation with um, low pressure at the 60 degrees north and high pressure actually near the poles, and again, an overturning circulation and, and very little precipitation at the very high latitudes.
So we have some idea of the, of the basic climate system. We know it from observations, uh, measurements across the globe, from ground stations, from balloons that have gone up through the atmosphere measuring the profiles, uh, from aircraft that have, that have measured things as they fly around, and also importantly from satellites which are now measuring um, temperature through the atmosphere, they're measuring the, the density and the pressure, they're measuring the amount of water vapour and indeed the composition of other gases and then they're measuring and looking at the cloud cover and how that's changing with time and indeed the composition of the clouds. So we have a wonderful data set that can describe the climate system um, and we can store that information and can use it as we go ahead in time. Going back in history, of course, we don't have the satellites, uh, the balloons the, and the temperatures back further than about, say, the middle of the 19th century and we have to rely more on what are referred to as proxy records. So these could be, for example, um, temperature records stored in um, ice cores or tree rings, which are indicators of what the temperature was at the time um, through uh, indirect methods. So, for example, um, in tree rings we know that the tree growth responds to temperature and humidity, and the width of the tree ring will tell us something about that. In the ice cores, you can record the um, um, oxygen isotopes in, in the air that's stored in the column of ice. And there will be, uh, there'll be a depletion of heavy, heavy isotope when the uh, air is colder. So that, again, is an indirect measure of the temperature. There's uh, records of climate in uh, ocean sediments, um, in uh, plankton, in all sorts of um, natural reservoirs which the, the very, very clever people that do this sort of work can extract the information. So we have records going back in time of what the climate was um, to a greater or lesser degree of, of accuracy over the globe and as a function of time and we're now storing the data from the satellites and the other uh, scientific measurements. Um, in understanding climate change, we really need to think about the, the physics and science of what's going on in the atmosphere and oceans and indeed in the ice and the land processes to understand those science in, in order to see what might happen in the future. And we can get all our scientific understanding together in climate models to predict uh, the change in the future. Uh, one of the main problems in climate science at the moment is trying to understand how climate will vary uh, over the regions in the future. So while we can be fairly clear what's going to happen to global um, average temperature, it's much more difficult to predict what will happen uh, in particular regions. Some regions are much more difficult than others. So while the uh, climate models can um, produce ENSO events, El Nino events, um, in principle quite well, it's very difficult to predict the actual timing of these events. And that requires a better understanding of the whole um, ocean-atmosphere interaction. Another um, uh, key issue in, in climate science is understanding how small particles in the atmosphere are affecting the, uh, the heating balance of the climate. So um, there's little particles in the atmosphere, some natural, some human produced, and they're affecting the uh, radiation coming in from the sun and the, and the heat radiation, and that's uh, a bit of a, a, a big unknown in uh, how climate will evolve in the future. Another um, key uncertainty that we need to be um, investigating further is uh, the question of how the ice at high latitudes will respond. So there's ice lying on the land and there's ice floating on the oceans uh, and they respond in different ways to um, global warming. So the ice on the water will melt in response to the warming of the water. Uh, the ice on the land is going to respond to um, air temperature. And um, the, the uh, knock-on effect from those things is also different because of course the ice floating, uh, floating on the water won't affect sea level rise because when the water melts the sea level will just remain the same, but the ice sitting on the land, when that melts, that will raise sea level. So that's a key uncertainty and very important to understand what might happen in the future. A very important aspect of climate science that we need to study further is um, the, uh, how often we get extreme events. And so what I mean by that is extreme rainfall, extreme heat, um, uh, incidents of flooding. Um, and those are things that don't happen very often, 
But of course, in terms of what's going to happen in the future, it's very important to know whether we understand the statistics of those events and the physics of how they're going to change in the future. So that's a big challenge for us with the models and with the understanding, is to predict the change in the statistics. So we're very well um, endowed now with uh, satellite observations of the climate, uh, with instruments across the globe, and with the uh, computer models. But in order to improve our um, understanding and indeed our forecast for the future, it would be better to have improvements in all of these things. So for example, with the climate models, if we can uh, increase the resolution, that means go to smaller and smaller scales, then that would help us to do uh, more accurate forecasts. Of course, to do um, higher resolution models means that we need to have bigger and bigger computers. Um, and indeed, all the MET services across the world will be asking their governments always for bigger and bigger computers. There are sort of slightly more intelligent ways to go about it rather than just bashing big computers. Uh, in terms of um, nesting smaller scale uh, uh, features inside a lower resolution, larger scale simulation. And there's a lot of work now on, on flexible and dynamic grid structures that will enable this sort of thing to be done more easily. There's more observations that need to be done, particularly in terms of ocean circulation. So we now understand that the, the oceans taking up the heat is one very important aspect of, of what determines the actual surface temperature. And that heat will get mixed at a slower or faster rates into the deep ocean. So we need measurements of the ocean circulations and the temperature in the oceans to try and understand how that happens and, and how it might change. Uh, we also need to maintain uh, and improve on satellites. So at the moment we have the, the meteorological satellites which are just doing the observations required for the, for the uh, weather forecasting and they can be accumulated into uh, good climate data sets. But for climate change we need to make sure that these are very stable, well calibrated, uh, accurate measurements that we know that when we get a trend or change in those data that the change is actually due to a change in the climate and not due to some change in the instruments that's been taken place. So that requires some very careful science and technology.